creativity and grading. Try telling people at your next social gathering that that is the topic of your next academic presentation and you'll be met with some raised eyebrows. There's a pervasive idea in our culture that somehow education and creativity are opposites. That the rigor, the discipline, and the standards that we associate with a university education are sometimes somehow toxic to creative development. My name is Natasha Haugness, and I've been teaching and supporting students and faculty in art and design colleges and universities for over 25 years. I've mostly been at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, but I've also taught and conducted workshops at other art and design colleges around the country. And on this journey, I've worked with a tremendous number of incredibly gifted teaching artists who know how to foster creativity in their classrooms. They manage to seamlessly integrate their teaching and learning activities, which are all working towards these really clear goals. And there's rigorous assessment happening all the time, but it's not discouraging students, it's actually propelling them forward. And you can see the ideas and excitement and creativity exploding off of the critique boards and the screens and out of the discussions, the critique discussions in these classrooms. Now, in addition to being in these classrooms, I've also looked at a lot of research about creative development. And while no one ever became a good teacher by simply reading research, um, these studies have really helped me to unpack some of this magic that I've been seeing. Um, and they've, it's helped me develop lenses that inform both my own teaching and my conversations with teaching artists who might be struggling with their classroom practice or might have questions about creative development in the classroom. So whether you are one of those wildly gifted teaching artists who's very comfortable teaching creativity in the classroom, or whether you're an educator who's struggling with teaching creativity in another discipline perhaps, I hope this video offers you a few techniques and some food for thought. The aha moment is at the heart of the creative process. It's when you have insight into a creative problem and it feels like these moments come out of the blue all the pieces fall into place and you know exactly what you need to do next it's euphoric and joyous and these are feelings that can be addictive for creative people these are the moments that creative people live for and work for as we nurture our own students to be creative practitioners, we should be doing all we can to lead them to these aha moments and to invite them into the joyous part of the creative process. So what can we as educators do to create possibilities for these moments to emerge? This is the question that we will explore. Now, before we get into the details of that specific question, let's look at some bigger principles of grading and the creative process. I mentioned earlier that many see grading as the enemy of creative development. Now this is not entirely unfounded. If you've ever had that singing teacher who told you that you had no talent or that drawing teacher who told you you were not gonna ever be good enough, you know this. Some ways to squelch creativity are by giving judgmental feedback with your grades, by making your grading process not constructive so that it's not helpful for future projects or by making it arbitrary. This last point is really important. I don't think anyone consciously decides to grade arbitrarily, but it can happen to the most well-meaning instructors. Let's take, for example, a new design instructor who might subconsciously ascribe to that grading squelches creativity belief that I mentioned earlier. She starts teaching, encouraging students, and she never mentions grades, but then the midterm rolls around and she's required by her college to enter grades. And she finally does this reluctantly at the deadline, uh, but without anything to back the grades up. Maybe she assigns all C's or all A's, and her students become confused and demotivated by these grades. So in this odd sort of paradox, this really well-meaning instructor's downplaying of grades actually ended up harming students in the way that she was trying to avoid in the first place. There are some practices that support creativity 
in grading. And that is when the grading includes helpful feedback, helpful constructive feedback that students can put into the next steps in their project or into future projects, and when that grading is based on transparent criteria. Now the aha moment that we're talking about in this video is part of a larger creative process, and I wanted to spend a minute talking about that. This process is not linear, although I'm going to put it on a line in a moment. <laughs> Experienced creative people often jump back and forth between the steps of the creative process. So they might define a problem, research it, prototype a solution, jump back to redefining the problem, combine ideas, and so on, several times before actually completing a project. Keith Sawyer, who is both an academic researcher and a creative practitioner, depicted this process in both the content and title of his book called Zigzag. Uh, he also wrote a more academic version of this book called Explaining Creativity. Now, Sawyer says that while experienced people zig and zag through their process, it can be helpful for novices or people like our students who are just learning to gain confidence in their creative processes to take a more linear approach to the process. So we're going to put this process on a line and there's also a linear aspect to the steps that precede this aha moment according to the research. So let's take a look at that. While these moments feel unpredictable, they feel like they come out of the blue, research tells us that there's a pattern of events that lead up to them. First of all, you get a problem and you have to think about it. You have to work hard to understand it. You explore ideas. It's hard work. You might hit a lot of dead ends. You might go down a lot of paths that kind of feel like they're leading nowhere. You inevitably hit a really big brick wall at a certain point. And finally, you give up. You feel like you just can't do any more and you give up on the problem. For our purposes, I'm going to call these steps hard work, creative blocks, and incubation. Incubation is actually a really important part of this process. It's that point where you can't think about the problem anymore. You um, finally have to put it aside. And it's after this incubation moment that actually the aha moments appear. It feels like they're coming out of nowhere, but they're actually the result of all of this hard work that you've done ahead of time, coming up against those creative blocks and finally giving up and letting your mind rest while it subconsciously seems to be working on these creative problems and then just pushes an idea forth. There's work after the aha moment as well. There's work to bring your idea into reality, but it tends to be more fun work because you have a goal in your mind, you know how the pieces fit together, and you really need to just get this work done to present your final product. So let's take a look at how this process maps onto a creative project or assignment that you might give in your classroom. We start with assigning a project and we end with the due date. Uh, often there's a grading rubric that accompanies the project. It might grade on something like concept, craft, and process. And I'm guessing that most everybody who's watching this video has done a lot of thinking about the creative process already, and you've probably included a lot of activities along the way to coax students through this process. You might have students brainstorm ideas, maybe do a little bit of peer review. You probably teach some skills. You might um, have them do research, all these different steps along the way. Strong students are going to be right there with you. You'll have them in the palm of your hand, and they will work through this process. And it might actually look something like the little process depicted on the line at the top of your screen right now. But there are some other students for whom this process doesn't really play out the whole way. They might seem like procrastinators, or they might seem disengaged. 
In my own experience of working with these students, I noticed that they have their eye on that final due date, but they just don't understand the importance of the in-class work that's leading up to it, or that process work that you're, you're giving them. They haven't internalized just how much work and what kind of work a creative project demands in the early stages. So while this creative process maps onto our project timeline well for the stronger students, some of the students who struggle are actually turning in their final drafts maybe here or here. And you've probably seen quite a few that get turned in right here. These are the students who don't get to the aha moment. They get mired in the hard work phase. They just don't get to that joyous point. Or maybe they do, but it's after the deadline, after they've turned their project in. And this is dangerous because it further reinforces that idea that the most creative ideas happen away from the classroom. These struggling students don't get pulled into a full creative cycle and they, as a result, they don't feel like they have any control over their process. They might become at risk of dropping out. So let's take a look at some ideas for using our grading practices and our assignment design to really pull students, especially these struggling students, into the full creative process. Now, we can't grade everything that students do. We grade what's important, the performance that shows the most important learning or evidence of the most important learning. A project that spans several class meetings should certainly be graded, and of course it makes sense to grade the final draft because that is where the evidence of a strong concept, skilled craftsmanship, and, and strong process is. The problem is, if a student is getting the grade on that process at the end of their project, it's too late for them to act on it. So we need to signal the importance of those early stages of a creative process. We need to communicate, hey, this thing we're doing in class, this brainstorming, this peer review, it's not just a good idea or a warm up for the main event. It's real work that needs to happen early in order for you to really complete your final project. So we need to really push those grading deadlines and push that feedback up a little bit earlier. Consider taking some of these steps that you do in your classroom and actually grading them. For example, you might take a research step or idea generation, peer feedback, and maybe something new to pull students away from their um, problem solving and their uh, creative process for a little while to try to uh, coax that incubation period along after a period of hard work. When you set up these graded process assignments, there are a few things to keep in mind. First of all, keep the criteria to an absolute minimum. Focus on getting students to do the work to put in the time and to do the labor. Don't focus on details of quality at this point. You really just want to get students working, 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 and keep your criteria to a minimum. I also don't recommend necessarily using letter grades at these early stages of a process. Letter grades tend to lead us down that path of getting really um, picky and detail-oriented with our grades. I advocate pass, not passing yet grades for the process steps in a larger process project. Let's take a look at what this might look like. Uh, my own students created public service announcements recently and one of the steps I graded them on was research. I had them find three credible sources and the most important information that they learned from each source. This is a pretty minimal assignment, but it's really important. By grading it, I'm checking in with all of my students and especially the ones who might kind of be slacking off, procrastinating, or just thinking that maybe this isn't that important a step in the process. If they give me one credible source, I say, great, not passing yet, you need two more. And they need to do that work again so that they can move forward. Idea generation might look like 
five possible approaches to your public service announcement. What might it look like as a song? What might it look like as a stop motion animation? There are many ways to approach this type of a, an assignment. Uh, some people ask for three good approaches and two bad ideas. Um, if you work in advertising, um, you might be asking your students for 50 taglines. I've seen that assignment before. The point here is that these ideas don't have to be good. They just have to be numerous. We know that the volume of, of ideas is related to the quality later on. Um, we don't want students to just get that one idea at the beginning of their process and hold on to it uh, with tunnel vision throughout. That does not really lead to good um, creative thinking. That's idea generation. Peer feedback. Often this happens in a classroom. Um, you may or you may not grade it uh, in a classroom. While we are all in this online world, I have my students do peer feedback outside of the class, and I have them submit evidence of their meeting, a summary of the feedback they received, and an outline of what they're going to do next. Again, this gives me some accountability that they've actually engaged in the peer feedback, that they've thought about it, and that they've taken something substantial away from it. And again, if they have these three things, they pass. If they don't, they need to go back and get more feedback or develop a plan. The point of a something new activity is explicitly to draw students' attention away from the project that they've been working on. This is meant to induce the incubation stage of the creative process, which is so important for insight and uh, aha moments to appear. Now, of course, if students haven't been working really, really hard at a project, a different project like this will just be distracting. So be careful. Only use it if students have really been working hard. And let them know that whatever you have them do is really important. Um, I have students read a completely different article. We do a lesson on something entirely different. We might play a grammar game or something like that to um, just really take their focus away from the project at hand for a while. When it comes to the end of the project, uh, if you've been doing these pass, not passing yet steps along the way, you'll have your process grade right there. Um, Maybe if students have completed four out of five of the steps, they can get a high mark. But you will have given them the feedback that was important to that process earlier in the process. So these are just some ideas to map some of these activities onto those important steps of the creative process, especially the ones that occur before the aha moments to really coax students into doing that work. Some art and design students don't really care about grades. A lot actually do, and when something is graded, it coaxes them into doing it. We tend to think of these students as nitpicky or maybe grade grubby, um, but if we use that knowledge to our advantage, we can lure them into something that they might not otherwise do, which is good for them in the end. As a quick review, grading practices that can support creative development. First of all, signal the importance of the early hard work steps in a creative project by grading those steps. Consider pass, not passing yet grades. Keep your criteria to a minimum. Focus on labor more than quality. And offer constructive feedback that helps them move forward through their process. The ideas I've shared with you in this video today are based on tip number 24 in Meaningful Grading, a Guide for Faculty in the Arts, written by Holg Holmgren, Martin Springborg, and me. It was published in 2019 by West Virginia University Press. And for more information about the research that the ideas in this video were based on, or for more ideas about how to integrate grading and creativity into your own teaching practice, I encourage you to check the book out.